For part seven of our current liabilities overview, we're gonna focus on sales tax payable. Now sales tax payable, when you're buying something, you usually have to pay sales tax on that item that you purchase. Well, it's gonna be the vendor's responsibility, usually, to collect that sales tax from you, hold on to that, and eventually give that to the government. Sales tax is a government requirement that each qualifying sale be charged an additional sales tax. Now, what do I mean by qualifying sale? Well, most food that's essential or a staple like milk or bread, it is not required to collect sales tax on it. But there are other items, car that you buy, you would have to pay sales tax on. So these sales taxes need to be collected by the vendors and then periodically reported on a sales tax return and the money sent to the government. This is where vendors can get into trouble because as they collect this money, if they commingle it and forget to put it aside and save it for the government and start using it for their other expenses, this is where you hear stories of businesses going out of business because they have not been able to pay their sales tax to the government because they've used it for other things. And you'll kind of see why that happens when we get into the transactions in a little bit. So each state and county has different rules on which items of services qualify for sales tax and what percentage to collect. So counties can have different rates and then a state may have a rate. So you add the state plus the county together. Each county may wind up coming up with a different percentage of sales tax that you need to collect for the jurisdiction that you live or operate in. So that brings us to the word nexus. What does nexus mean? Well, nexus is the term regarding your responsibility as a vendor to collect sales tax. So generally, if you have a business that has a physical presence in a location, you're going to collect sales tax every time someone comes into your store and buys a sales taxable item. Now, you will need to collect that sales tax from your customers for that jurisdiction. One of the problems is online sales tax issues. So if you've ever bought something online from another state, you might not have paid sales tax. And this is the issues that are brought forward that over the last 10, 15 years, there have been a lot of rulings and cases to try to make those qualify for certain states. So court rulings have increased nexus. Such items as economic nexus have been brought up. So that's when you don't have a physical location but you meet other guidelines that require you to collect sales tax for that jurisdiction anyway. An example would be remote employees working from other states or jurisdictions can trigger that nexus rules. So if you've got an employee working in another state and you have sales to that state, that could trigger the nexus rules and you might have to collect sales tax from anyone who buys product from your organization that lives in that state. So each state has its own rules related to Nexus, and so it's important to understand those. And working on sales tax in a large multinational company can be a career because you might be dealing with not only federal, state, and local uh, sales tax rules, you could be dealing with foreign sales tax rules also. So lots of complicated areas, lots of work in the sales tax area, both as an outside consultant or working internally in a multinational company. So let's go over sales tax a little more in depth. How it's collected is two different ways. One is it's either an additional cost that's added on to your sales price, or it can be included in the sales price. And I'm gonna go over examples of both of these areas. So let's start out with an example of the sales tax being an additional cost to the transaction. So let's say you graduated from college, and you got your first high paying job and you've collected some money. So you're ready to upgrade from that rusty gas guzzling station wagon that was passed on to you. And you're ready to, you know, hand that down to your younger brother so he can enjoy the thrills of a hand me down vehicle. Now you're ready to go off to the car dealership and get a brand new vehicle with that money that you've saved from your new job and move on. Uh, from that beaten down gas guzzling station wagon. So you fall in love with a brand new hybrid car at the dealership. Looks beautiful. You negotiate an $18,000 sales price on your new sweet ride. When you get the sales contract, you see that there is a 5% sales tax charge 
added on to it. So the cost was $18,000, but that 5% sales tax is added on. So it's 18,000 times one plus the sales tax rate or 1.05. So you see a cost of $18,900. So you've saved up and you write that check for the car of 18,900. So how does the dealer record that sale? So take a second to look at those numbers. Again, 18,000 sale price, 18,009 is what you paid for it. So there's a $900 sales tax in there. So how does the dealer record the sale? Well, first off, let's look at the dealer before you walked onto the site to buy your new sweet ride. They had this car sitting there in inventory, so you'll see on their balance sheet they had car inventory of $15,000. They have accounts payable because they owe the manufacturer the $15,000 for the car that they bought to sell to you. So they're sitting there with a balance sheet that's in balance with $15,000 in assets, $15,000 in liabilities or liabilities and equity added together. They haven't sold anything yet, so there's no car revenue, there's no cost of sales, no net income. So that's how the dealer looks before you walked onto the dealership. So you buy your car, you pay them cash of $18,900, that means they get to record sales revenue of $18,000 for that car, and they also note that they have a sales tax payable for $900 of sales tax they collected that they're going to owe to the government. Now, I know we're talking about liabilities here, but as you know, every sale really has two transactions usually when it deals with merchandise, the sale itself and the cost of sales related to the merchandise. So we're going to show that $15,000 that we bought the car from the manufacturer of as leaving our lot as being sold. So we've got a cost of goods sold of $15,000 that's debited and our car inventory is left the lot. So it's credited against that car inventory for $15,000. So your transaction created two transactions for the dealership. So now let's look at what their income statement looks like after the transaction you made. They've got an $18,000 car sales revenue and they also reflect that cost of sales of $15,000 so the dealership made $3,000 of net income on that car sale that you had. So let's look what their balance sheet looks like. They've now added cash of $18,900. They no longer have that car on their lot anymore, so that's zero for inventory. So their total assets are $18,900. They've got liabilities. They still haven't paid the manufacturer yet, so they still got that accounts payable of $15,000. But you'll see the new sales tax payable in there for $900 and we bring the net income over into the equity section of $3,000 so now we're back in balance we've got assets of $18,900 liabilities of $15,900 and a equity of $3,000 to also add up to the $18,900 and we're in balance so the next step is the car company is going to pay that sales tax that they've collected to the government. So they'll get rid of that sales tax payable through a debit and they'll also write a check and that's a credit to cash for $900. So their new balance sheet has only $18,000 in it now because that $900 check has gone to the government. You'll see down in the liability section, the sales tax payable has also gone away. So we have assets of $18,000, accounts payable of $15,000, and that equity for the net income of $3,000, $18,000. We're back in balance. We don't owe the government anything anymore. We just owe the manufacturer for that $15,000 uh, accounts payable. So it's important to note that, again, how long did the dealer have that $900 before they had to pay it? That can be as long as three months. So they're holding on to multiple sales, let's say, and multiple $900. That means that's a lot of money in there. This is, again, where I said vendors can get into trouble if they hold on to that cash and commingle it and start using it for other things. When that three months is up and it's time to pay the government, if they don't have the cash left to pay the government, they can get into trouble, get serious penalties, may even lose their business over it. But another note I want you to remember and realize is sales tax is not an expense for the vendor when they collect it from the sales. So if you'll notice that sales tax 
that was collected never went to the income statement. So it should never be on the income statement of the vendor when it's related to sales. Now, again, if this vendor has gone off and purchased things from other people, it may have paid sales tax. So that's the time that it'll become an expense in the income statement is when they purchase something from somebody else. But when they're a vendor who sells things, it's only on their balance sheet as a liability. I hope that's clear related to sales tax. So now let's dive into example two, when sales tax is included into the price. So here's our example. Let's say you take your significant other to a craft show. Big craft show, lots of vendors, lots of cool stuff. Well, lots of the vendors are selling their goods and your significant other actually loves a vase that you see from one of the pottery vendors there. And you think, what a great birthday gift for your significant other. So you sneak back to the vendor and you purchase that vase for $65, sales tax included. Now, you know that the local sales tax is 4%, so you're wondering why they're not charging you an additional 5%. But the vendor says, don't worry about it. They will take care of it. You only have to pay the $65 because again, the sales tax is included. So you walk away with your nice, new, beautiful vase for $65. So how will the vendor record this transaction? Well, they will take the cash sales of $65 and divide it by one plus the sales tax rate. So let's review that. $65 divided by 1 plus 0.04 or 4%. So 65 divided by 1.04. That will give us a sales price of $62.50. So let's double check that. If we have a sales price of $62.50, we multiply it by the 4% sales tax rate and we get $2.50 in sales tax. So the $62.50 sales price plus the $2.50 in sales tax equals our $65 that we had given them. So let's see the accounting for that. So we've got the vendor recording their cash in of $65 and that's their debit. They're also going to credit sales revenue of $60.50. That's the sales that we had calculated. And they're also going to record sales tax payable of $2.50 that they will owe the government for that $65 sales tax included vase purchase. So I hope that helps you understand sales tax is included in the price for cash sales. Now, one last note I want to make before we finish up on our current liabilities sales tax payable discussion. Use taxes. You may have heard that before, but if a buyer is responsible to report the sales tax, so not the vendor. So the vendor's off in another state, and so they've sold you something online. You receive it. You didn't have to pay sales tax. They didn't pay sales tax to their government. You may be responsible to pay sales tax, and so that's called a use tax because you're using something, you've got to pay use tax on it. There could be also personal property that you have to pay use taxes on, depending on the rules within the jurisdiction for which you operate. So this online sales that I talked about is, is kind of an example of that. The vendor did not charge you that. The buyer is responsible to report and submit a use tax so that use tax is related to sales tax. And some companies will actually have an account called sales and use taxes payable. Again, use taxes aren't just these sales taxes from other states. There are all sorts of sales and use tax rules that companies have to follow. So you have to be aware of all of those. So some states will have a personal income tax return line that will, will have you admit to any online sales that you made that you didn't have to pay sales tax on, and they're going to want you to report that use tax or that sales tax that was never collected by the vendor. So that's an area where you may see it on your personal tax return also. So again, lots of complicated issues in sales tax and sales use taxes. It is a career for some people. So I hope this has given you a good overview summary on sales tax payable. Remember to like this video 
Also, comment below if there's a lecture on some accounting or auditing topic that you'd like to hear about, and please subscribe. Thanks for listening today, and have a great day.